Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Alessandro Federico Petriconi Jr., a.k.a. Alex Rocco, who died recently at the age of 79, one of my favorite character actors. Alex Rocco was one of those guys, you see him everywhere on television and in the movies, he was always playing a thug, but you never knew his name, but he was a great actor. And in fact, he was a badass in real life growing up. He was part of the Winter Hill Gang in Boston. Another guy from the gang hit on his girlfriend. That guy wound up dead. He probably didn't do it, but that started a gang war. And Al Traco figured he better hightail it out of there. He had to choose between Miami and Los Angeles. He went to Los Angeles to become an actor, and the rest is history. Created one of the great characters in movie history and one of the great scenes in movie history in The Godfather. He plays Mo Green. Do you know who I am? Ironically, he plays a Jewish gangster there. Coppola just told him to use his hands a little differently than the Italian gangsters, and he pulled it off beautifully. Here he is with Al Pacino. Hey, Mike. Hello, fellas. Everybody's here. Freddie, Tom, good to see you, Mike. How are you, Mo? All right. You got everything you want? The chef cooked for you special. The dancers will kick your tongue out, and your credit is good. Draw chips for everybody in the room so they can play in the house. My credit good enough to buy you out? <laughs> buy me out. Casino. The hotel. Corleone family wants to buy you out. The Corleone family wants to buy me out? No. I buy you out. You don't buy me out. Your casino loses money. Maybe we can do better. You think I'm skimming off the top, Mike? You're unlucky. <laughs> you goddamn guineas really make me laugh. I do you a favor and take Freddy in when you're having a bad time, and then you try to push me out. Wait a minute. You took Freddy in because the Corleone family bankrolled your casino because the Molinari family on the coast guaranteed his safety. Now, we're talking business. Let's talk business. Yeah, let's talk business, Mike. First of all, you're all done. The Corleone family don't even have that kind of muscle anymore. The Godfather is sick, right? You're getting chased out of New York by Bazzini and the other families. What do you think is going on here? You think you can come to my hotel and take over? I talked to Bazzini. I can make a deal with him and still keep my hotel. Is that why you slapped my brother around in public? Oh, no, that, that, that was nothing, Mike. Now, now uh, Mo did mean nothing by that. Sure, he flies off the handle once in a while, but, but Mo and me were good friends, right, Mo? Huh? I got a business to run. I got to kick asses sometimes to make it run right. We had a little argument, Freddie and I, so I had to straighten him out. You straightened my brother out. He was banging cocktail waitresses two at a time. Players couldn't get a drink at the table. What's wrong with you? I leave for New York tomorrow. Think about a price. Do you know who I am? I'm Mo Green. I made my bones when you were going out with cheerleaders. Yeah, Fredo tells Michael you don't talk to Mo Green like that, but Michael does talk to Mo Green like that. He gave him the full... Christmas story treatment a little later on. He shot his eye out and he didn't use a Red Rider rifle. In real life, Alex Rock was a sweet, gentle guy. He won an Emmy for the famous Teddy Z on television, which I never saw. He was great in Get Shorty. He played a record producer, supposedly dating Suzanne Plachette in That Thing You Do. But my favorite movie of his was the gangster movie that was better than The Godfather, The Friends of Eddie Coyle, which we talked about when we did Peter Yates. He played Jimmy Scalise, Jimmy Scale, who was buying guns for bank robberies from Robert Mitchum back in Boston. And as he said, there's a lot of people who get The Friends of Eddie Coyle, and here he talks about working with Robert Mitchum. There's a lot of people who get Eddie Coyle. The day before the shooting, I'm at the Ritz Carlton, and I know Bob Mitchum is there. The company put us up there, and... Uh, I called his room. I was a nervous wreck. I said, hi, Bob, Alex Rocco. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I was wondering. I, I, don't, I don't mean to be a pain in the ass, but you want to work on some material we ever seen tomorrow? I said, yeah, meet me down at the bar. Went down at the bar. First thing he did with my script was tear it up. We got blistered. We both smoked a joint. And that's my introduction to him. He was wonderful. Bob would start all day with the cannabis. And then when it came to my close-up, he was so professional. We were in a, that trailer where I was selling the guns. Big stars don't stay and do what we call off-stage dialogue. Bob Mitchum, one of the best. Stayed with me, wanted me to be good, cared about my performance. Yeah. He was a sweetheart. Even after, when we wrapped, he found me and he'd come up with two bags of blue. He just likes to talk about how we laid a fart in front of a Catherine Hepburn or Susan Hayward. And he, he was a delight. I mean, I, I miss him already. Of course, I came from a rough corner, went to Hill, and I knew a couple of wise guys, you know, how he went.
to, to Buddy McLean. And Bob loved that. We used to go have drinks. It wasn't really my scene, but Mitchum kind of loved to hang around. Whatever Bob wanted, you know, I mean, people just enjoyed his company and he was so down to earth. Oh, one more thing about Mitchum that. You know that monologue speech he had in the bowling alley with uh, Stephen King? I wanted 10 guns. I want them tomorrow night. I'll be right there where we were before, yeah? We were in the hotel and we're having coffee, and Bob had to do that scene. He said, Rocco, will you look at the script and see if I got my lines down? He not only had the lines down, he had the ends and the butts. It's a three-page monologue. Yeah. Or maybe more. He says, come on. You, uh, you must have really been working on it. No, I looked at it this morning. He has one of those photographic memories. The gift. I have to like lock myself in a bathroom to learn mine. Alex Racco talking about Robert Mitchum. We're going to move on now to our feature tie, Theo Bickell, who died recently at the age of 91. He was one of the most versatile singer-actors there was. He was a brilliant man, spoke I don't know how many languages, was a member of Mensa, which is ironic because he played a Mensa member on Columbo. He was politically active, he stood up for his ideals, and he was an all-around great man. He was a nice Jewish boy born in Eastern Europe. His family emigrated to Vienna. They had to leave Vienna when the Nazis came. He emigrated then to Israel, Palestine then, and was on a kibbutz for several years. He wasn't good at farming, but he was good at singing. He emigrated then to England and then to the United States. He was in movies and on Broadway, and he was the original Captain Von Trapp in The Sound of Music, opposite Mary Martin, and I'll let him tell the story. Edelweiss was written, it wasn't in the original score at all. It was written 11 days before we opened on Broadway. Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein went into a hotel room at the Ritz-Carlton in Boston, which had a piano in it, and they wrote me a brand new old Austrian folk song called Edelweiss. But it sounded authentic, in fact, so authentic, that at one point I came out of the stage show and the woman said to me, oh, I love that song, Edelweiss. Of course, I only know it in the original German. Here he is with Mary Martin singing the song that Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote specifically for him. Edelweiss, Another memorable Broadway role was about a decade later as Tevye on Fiddler on the Roof. I'm not the first Tevye, that was Zero Mostel. But then I started playing Fiddler on the Roof and I played it all over the United States and Canada. I played it everywhere. And over the course of some 49 years, I played it over 2,100 times. Somebody counted. I didn't count. I'm not arrogant enough to do that. But 2,100 times is a lot of times. I am born to play Tevye because Tevye is my own yeah. grandfather. Yeah, my mom loved that, I'll tell you that. My first exposure to Theo Bickell was as a folk singer. He was one of the great folk singers of the late 50s and early 60s. He was an activist, not a communist, though. He had a strong commitment to civil rights. He sang a lot of folk songs, and he was a regular on the early 60s television show Hootenanny, which featured folk singers. He sang folk songs in a whole bunch of languages. And here he is with a young Judy Collins. Now we are old and ready to go. We get to thinking what happened a long time ago. Had a lot of kids, trouble and pain. But, oh Lord, we do it again. Oh, kisses sweeter than wine. Great folk singer, but check out how versatile he was in movies and television. Here he is in the African Queen as a German captain with Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn. You are accused of being a spy in the service of the British Armed Forces. Have you anything to say that might lead this court to believe otherwise? I told you I was fishing. This is the gesamte Beweismaterial der Anklage, Herr Kapitän. As your fellow prisoner has already learned, the penalty for not answering this court is death 
Will you be so good as to tell us exactly where and how you acquired torpedoes? Mr. Allnatch made them. How very interesting. You don't believe me, do you? In the Defiant Ones with Tony Curtis and Sidney Poitier, he got a Best Supporting Actor nomination as a Humane Southern Sheriff long before Carol O'Connor did it in the heat of the night. Hey, Mac, how come they changed a white man to a black? The warden's got a sense of humor. What did he say just now? He said not to worry about catching them. They'd probably kill each other before they go five miles. Wait a minute. What's the matter? No dogs. Max, do we have to go all over that again? No killer dogs, Frank. Look, Max. We crossed the county line this morning. I didn't want to have to bring this up, but you're out of your jurisdiction. Take off the muzzle, Sully. Wait a minute, Sully. We're wasting time, Max. We're supposed to find them, not execute. I'm giving the orders. Go ahead, Sully. Just a minute, Sully. You make one move, and I'm going to shoot them. For the love of Mike, Max. You going to listen to me? All right. I think those track it. We close in. I'll go on ahead by myself. Anything happens to me, you can let the other dogs loose. Not the fault. I don't like it. I don't have to. Contrast that with his memorable Zoltan Carpathian, My Fair Lady, who attempts to unmask Audrey Hepburn. He tells Rex Harrison he spoke 32 languages. He didn't speak that many, but he spoke a lot. Maestro! Maestro! Don't you remember me? No, I don't know you. I'm your pupil. Your first, your greatest, your best pupil. I'm Zoltan Carpathy, that marvelous boy. Oh, ah, I made your name famous throughout Europe. You teach me phonetics, you cannot forget me. Why don't you have your hair cut? Have your imposing appearance, your figure, your brow. If I had my hair cut, nobody would notice me. Where did you get all these old coins? These are decorations for language. Oh, the Queen of Transylvania is here this evening. I'm indispensable to her at these official international parties. I speak 32 languages. I know everyone in Europe. No imposter can escape my detection. And a memorable attempted seduction of Edith Bunker and all in the family. Listen, this one is for you. Ich küsse ihre Hand, Madame. Und träum es wär ihr Mund. Ich bin ja so galant, Madame. Doch das hat seinen Grund. Oh, I feel like I'm at the Lawrence Wilk show. That's beautiful. What does it mean? It means I kiss your hand, Madame. And dream it would be more. Oh. 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 The genius of Theo Pickel. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepp. So we're going to close tonight with Buddy Bowie, who died recently at the age of 74. A good old boy songwriter. He worked with Bobby Goldsboro. He worked with Roy Orbison. And he wrote for the Atlanta Rhythm Section in the 1970s. But right now out there in Eufaula, Alabama, he wrote some of the great 1960s songs for the Classics 4 and their late, great lead singer, Dennis Yost. As a tribute to Buddy Boo, I'm going to play three of them. A lot of people sang, but nobody did them better than Dennis Yost in the Classics 4. Here's their biggest, Spooky. And roll buddy Bill thinks this one stormy is their best, and it's hard to argue with him. You are the sunshine, baby. Whenever you smile, but I call you stormy today. Oh, stormy. Oh, stormy. Back, back, back. Question that's hard to beat, but I decided to close the tribute to Buddy Bowie with this one Traces of Love. Faded photograph, covered now with lines and creases, tickets torn in half, memories and bits and pieces, traces of love.